from the shores of beautiful Lake Coeur d'Alene in the heart of North Idaho. Local, regional, national, and international guests discuss their topics on our forum. The North Idaho College Public Forum. With your host and moderator, political scientist, Tony Stewart. I'm very pleased to welcome you back to our second week of uh, dealing with Habitat for Humanity International. Uh, last week we looked at it globally and uh, discussed what uh, uh, it's all about. And this week we have two of our three guests back from last week. And we want to talk about the summer of 1999 when our two guests worked for Habitat for Humanity in Fiji. And we're so delighted to have you both back. We had a great time last week on dealing with the overview. Now let's look at your latest trip. And we know you have slides with you in a few minutes. We'll look at those so our people can visit uh, with you uh, to that beautiful spot. And I want to first of all welcome to the program Mona Klinger, who teaches in the Department of Speech at North Idaho College. And I must add, has also uh, been a performer on our uh, what we call our Chautauqua series. And uh, Mona, welcome back. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. And her spouse is here, who too also has been uh, on the Chautauqua performance. And uh, with his uh, spouse has gone to uh, this trip as well as others. Our second guest is Chad Klinger, who is also a member of the faculty and teaches in the Department of English. Welcome to you too, Chad. We're just so delighted to have both of you here again. Thank you, Tony. Uh, some two or three years ago, we did a program with you on one of your other trips. And we commend you. We know that you financially uh, have uh, sponsored yourself to go help others that are in need. And as always, I'm very pleased to have regular panelist Steve Schink, who is the Vice President of College Relations and Development with Federal College. And Steve is invited to commence our question with our guests today. Thank you, Tony. Um, many people in the audience saw last week's show. And, and what I'm going to ask now is going to be a bit redundant for them, but I hope they'll bear with us, because uh, some people may not have the background that they need to, to enjoy this show a little bit better. Um, could you give us the short course on Habitat for Humanity, what it is and what it does? Uh, Habitat for Humanity internationally, as well as nationally or locally, um, is dedicated to providing decent, affordable housing for those who can demonstrate the need, uh, but also the ability to pay. And uh, sometimes that also involves sweat equity, the ability to work on the project. Um, <clears throat> it, of course, was founded by Millard Fulmer and Mary uh, Fuller in the 1970s. Um, it has a largely Christian mission. Um, and um, I think that's good, uh, good summary. And I'll throw mm -hmm. in that it's about a 23 year old organization mm -hmm. that's built mm -hmm. 80,000 houses in the United States. I don't know. Or maybe was that, that, was that worldwide from last uh, that's worldwide. Mm -hmm. week's mm -hmm. show? Mm -hmm. um, good. Thank you. Now, I, I yeah, wonder. I just want to get Mona to do her mic. Her mic's kind of covered up there. And she'll break it out. Thank you. So we'll make sure we hear you too, Mona. Okay. Okay, um, I, I had I thought about asking you this directly about Fiji, but I think your answers to those questions will be much more effective when we go to slides in a minute. Um, but let me ask this more general question. Um, the Fiji trip, your last trip, was not the first one you've made with Habitat. Tell us a little about your personal experiences with Habitat for Humanity, where you've gone and, and how you came to go to those places. Well, um, I guess way back in my mind, I always wanted to be a missionary. And of course, that was just the dream when I was a young child. But I always thought it would be terrific sometime to go uh, to one of the far corners of the earth uh, for a good cause. And so a number of years ago, uh, our family decided we would go to uh, volunteer with Habitat for Humanity. And we chose Belfast, Northern Ireland, uh, thinking it would be kind of a, maybe a good easement into this kind of activity because uh, they spoke English, for goodness sakes, and uh, it's Europe. And we went uh, three summers ago and uh, had a wonderful time. Uh, it really is a working vacation, a uh, wonderful way to see uh, a culture, live with a culture, and feel as though you're doing something uh, positive. You and your two daughters, who were, who were how old at that time? Uh, actually, only our younger daughter went to oh, that one, but uh, our, both of our daughters went to Fiji. I see. And our younger daughter was only 16 at the time, mm -hmm. 17, and uh, we spent the two weeks there in Belfast. Mm -hmm. So Fiji came up. Um, in fact, last year we decided we'd, we'd do another trip. And in November, um, the beaches of Fiji sounded like a very nice idea. So it wasn't <laughs> totally out of the goodness of our hearts. So there was a little bit of uh, the idea of that uh, we, we long for the sunshine. Well, after, I, 
I'm as eager to see the slides as I'm sure the audience is, but I'll sneak in one quick question. You said you chose Northern Ireland. Ireland. Mm -hmm. There is that opportunity with Habitat for Humanity to mm -hmm. choose an international location? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You can find out on their website or through their literature uh, where they have short-term missions, when they are, and uh, so happens with Fiji. There are several, actually, you could have chosen them on. And um, but once you make a choice and are accepted, then you communicate with the team leader for a few months, and um, eventually it all falls together. Excellent. Thank you, Steve. Uh, I'd promised our viewers that we would pass some slides, and that we're going to ask our uh, producer to put those slides up. And if the two of you would take us through, uh, I believe we have about six slides we're going to show. And uh, you can tell us uh, what they are and uh, where you went, and, uh, and we'll, we'll view those. Here's the first one. Uh, that's our youngest daughter, Holly. Um, hauling some building materials past some of the uh, existing housing in this small village of Lomai in the interior towards the center of the main island of uh, Viti Levu, um, a village without uh, power with uh, just sort of minimal running water that was piped down, the gravity flow from a reservoir upstream. And um, anyway, that's the condition of the housing. You can see it's largely bamboo thatched with um, metal roofs and Usually they're just one room, people just sleep on the ground. And, um, and, and I, I assume in this second slide mm -hmm. that we have here, this is one of, the built, one of the homes that's been constructed. Is this one of the ones that you worked on? Yes, we worked on five houses. We built five houses while we were there. And uh, so people are not, uh, um, mis uh, they don't misunderstand. It's decent, affordable homes. And so uh, these houses have no electricity, there's no plumbing. Uh, but as you notice from the construction, uh, it, they're strong, uh, they're uh, raised because there's a lot of flooding in that area. Um, Here you are working uh, as this? Yes, this is, I'm working there with our older daughter, Brooke, who is a professional ballerina. So this was a, a real interesting experience for her. We, we really had very strange expectations of this trip. We kind of saw ourselves you know, in near the water or something like that. And here we were like an hour and a half um, from, you know, from um, Suva, mm -hmm. the capital, on a dirt road, and we really were in the middle of nowhere. And this photograph? <laughs> <laughs> well, right in the center, you can see one of uh, our dinner guests uh, <laughs> recently prepared and uh, paraded through the village, uh, shanked by loin. And um, that was a big photo opportunity for us. We thought that was pretty wild. Um, and there I am with two of the Ratus, or chiefs, the one in the center, chief of the or son of the chief of the village. Um, the other was. Um, on the left uh, was working with Habitat uh, from another village. Uh, they did a lot of the sort of legal work with signing leases and mortgages and making arrangements and so forth. Yeah. Well, it's, well, it looks like a very fine uh, country weather-wise. And, and th that for the Klinger family was home sweet home for the two weeks we were there. Just uh, for you stayed here. Uh, yeah. the family of, our family of four moved in with a family of five in what is really about a 12 by 20 foot, 25 foot so nine of you one room chair. <laughs> yeah. One room, um, no furniture. Uh, it was really uh, very primitive, and uh, the tremendous poverty of the village uh, was beyond what we expected. Uh, totally subsistence living. People work from morning till night, uh, with just enough to get by on. Um, really quite a culture shock. But fortunately, our host family there was, was just wonderful people. We had Great That's a couple of questions I was going to ask. One is mm -hmm. about the people, and uh, I'm sure they were very appreciative of what you were doing, but a very friendly people, and, and I would assume very sociable. And share something about the people with you. Well, Fiji has two populations, uh, native Fijian and Indian, uh, largely that came in as a labor force during the English colonial you know, sugar uh, plantation era. Uh, the countryside tends to be uh, dotted by the uh, Fijian villages, and uh, that's where we were, so we, uh, and of course, Fijians are Christian, um, and most of the Indians are Hindu. Um, in some ways, uh, very civilized, like the British, they have tea twice a day, and, and, um, and uh, they get very dressed up for church, and, and it's amazing what they do. I mean, they have lovely clothes that are hand laundered in the river, you know, and so forth. Um, but just, just wonderful people. They mo most of them spoke a fair amount of English. And 
uh, by lovely clothes, meaning mm -hmm. lovely clean clothes, mm -hmm. and yet the women uh, had to drag uh, the clothes down about 64 stairs down to the river and then wash them like you see in the in the National Geographic with the the rock and the stick, and then lug 80 pounds of wet laundry back up these 84 stairs to the uh, village again. I mean, uh, I tell my students when I they talk about this, go home and kiss your Maytag tonight because uh, <laughs> uh, the kind of work they have to do is just incredible. And so by lovely, uh, at, at the church you'll see the men and the women in these uh, you know, spotless white outfits, but that was only because the women were down there pounding them with the rock and the stick for hours. We totally were, amazing. Yeah. We were in the pre-industrial revolution mm -hmm. era here, like stepping back 400 years. And um, I think in some ways uh, Rousseau was right. The, um, these people had a wonderful sense of family. There were kids everywhere, and everybody's kids were in everybody's homes, and, and uh, they loved their children. And it's really, well, from what we could family. see, quite a community spirit you know, among these 150 people. So um, what they had was um, sort of cultural tendency to share everything, and often without asking that uh, if someone wants something of yours, you know, go get it. And, um, it's, it's and they treated us that mm -hmm. way, too. If you mm -hmm. wanted something, uh, take it, please, it's yours. Uh, um, the uh, host father, Mesu, uh, insisted that Chad would take one of his skirts to wear, and Chad hasn't had a lot of opportunity to wear them here in North, I in North Idaho, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, that's something that Mesu insisted that Chad mm -hmm. take home with him. They're really a wonderful people. Um, wonderful singing uh, and great mm -hmm. faith. That uh, was so inspiring. I... Fiji. Chad Mona, I don't want to leave Fiji for mm -hmm. long, but um, contrast uh, your experience in Fiji with the experience you'd had previously in Northern Ireland. Uh, what, for instance, w w was the living arrangement like in Northern Ireland? Uh, in Ireland, we stayed at a Catholic retreat center, and so, so we had uh, very spare rooms, but uh, very adequate, uh, a bed and a place to wash and a um, little uh, potty down the hallway, that kind of thing. Um, we were driven around in a big van. We had wonderful food. The Irish food was terrific, and we often would eat out in uh, restaurants. Uh, in Lomai Village, it was uh, very different. Um, we, we shared the house with the family. Uh, we would share their food. Uh, for example, instead of going to a restaurant for breakfast, uh, we were served tea or coffee when we first woke up about 6, 6.15 in the morning with the roosters and maybe a rooster or a chicken running through the house uh, to help wake us up. And then we might be served uh, a scone, which is incredible because they would uh, make these on these little propane stoves, or a big old root. We often got a taro root, the whole root itself, and uh, that was part of our, of our breakfast. Um, we didn't eat in restaurants. So we would eat in a large common area. Uh, and we would serve the most exotic things, including uh, the uh, fatted calf that you saw. And we also had a, a meal, several meals of eel. So it was really quite the, quite the experience that way. Um, but in terms of the richness of the experience, I would say it's hard to compare them. They each had its own, each had its own uh, wonderful qualities. And I think, in my mind, um, I would never travel any other way um, because as a teacher of intercultural communication, um, you can travel to a country, but you won't experience until you actually mm -hmm. live it among the people like that. Not that I know everything about Fiji or Northern Ireland, but my experience is far richer than just traveling someplace like that. How are host families selected? Do, do they, now, that host mm -hmm. family was, was not the family that eventually moved into the home you were building, were they? No. no. Mm -hmm. some, of them, some of the host families uh, did eventually get a home. Mm -hmm. But ours did not. I think it's if you had enough uh, space. Uh, some of the uh, people in the village uh, didn't even live in a large enough, uh, I mean, a large place like we were living in. Some of us had like four by six lean tos with dirt floors. So I think the family had to demonstrate that they could house us and feed us uh, some meals and also uh, have enough uh, family members to do things like laundry and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Chad, did you meet the family that did move into the house you were building? Uh, yes. And can mm -hmm. you tell me a little bit about them? I mean, it almost mm -hmm. looks like a a there subsistence were, kind of, of a, of a uh, it is, economy. A, it is. Uh, there's very little cash, uh, aside from what they make going mm -hmm. to Suva, the big city, and selling some, some of their crops. Um, there were five houses that our team was working on in the village, and uh, I'm not quite sure how it was decided. I think, though, it was a communal uh, decision that involved the chief. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, anyway, I'm not sure how the five 
uh, homeowners were selected, but plans were uh, for, I think, 10 more houses uh, in the near future for others. So. Um, and so and you also met mm -hmm. the, the family that was going to occupy the house you built in Northern Ireland. Yes, yes. and we worked mm -hmm. alongside with them. And that's the exciting mm -hmm. part, is that you're actually working with those people. And they're so appreciative. And like in Northern Ireland, they could not have believed that people would come to America to help them build home, their own home to live in, which is you know, also what we felt in uh, Fiji. Um, my older daughter, Brooke, and I worked on a house together with a team. And um, we, we were working with the man whose house it was going to be. And uh, we didn't know much about his story till almost the last day. Uh, he was living, uh, he was one of the ones living in a four by six lean-to with a dirt floor. He lived there with several people, like uh, cousins and that kind of thing, and his mother. And moving into the Habitat house, uh, one of the sayings of Habitat is changing lives one house at a time. And we found out at the dedication that he needed that house in order to ask a woman to marry him. Because how could he bring his bride into the four by six lean-to? So, you know, what a, what a privilege on our part to be part of that. Mm -hmm. And as the dedications went on uh, in the ceremony, very nice ceremony they have at the dedication, um, the pastor would say that these are the homes that these families are going to have forever. That's wonderful. Story. Unlike what we think, you know, forever these are the homes that they're going to and have. If I, could, mm -hmm. if I could add to that story, it was one from Belfast. Um, one of the homeowners that was on the site with us uh, had been a professional prize fighter, boxer, had been in a devastating car accident about 10 years earlier. Uh, had a disability and had been on welfare essentially ever since, uh, as many people in Northern Ireland are. Mm -hmm. um, he was, he, um, his wife actually, um, child had actually been accepted for the home. Um, she had the means, I guess, to pay for it. But because of her duties working and with childcare, she couldn't do the sweat equity. She couldn't be on the site for the 300 hours or whatever. So she asked her ex-husband, they had been divorced um, uh, during their troubles, and she asked him if he could help out that way. And through that, they got back together again. And, and they lived in the right home together. And, and so. Those are tremendous yeah. stories. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. What makes those Steve's indicate so powerful is not only do they have a wonderful home over their head and uh, just the quality of life they get, but it's the story of the family and the, and the very humanistic results that are so powerful. While I was watching the slides, I viewed where you stayed and then the home you were building, one of the homes you were building. Uh, when those are finished and they move in, others in the community must just marvel at what a beautiful thing this is. It would be like a, a very, very expensive home compared to what you lived in. So how do others react to those? Do they give parties for others to come uh, from their community? My assumption that there would be some jealousy or something. Uh, I don't know whether there was or well, as Chad right, said, there, there's mm -hmm. plans for 10 more houses. Right. So I think what's mm -hmm. going to happen with Lomai Village anyway is that it's a plan to uh, get as many homes uh, made by Habitat as possible. So it may be uh, in the next several years the whole village will be rebuilt. That, that's a, a distinct yeah. possibility. And uh, the family that we stayed with had a 18-year-old son, Buli, and he is going to be getting a home next year. So they're all very excited about that. They're all saving money to, uh, to pay for that. And I think his where the real value of what Habitat is doing comes in. Here's a culture that gradually will be siphoned off from this rural subsistence existence. Mm -hmm. Their children will be siphoned off to the big city. Uh, Fiji's only had television for three years, um, but that's the beginning of the end. Um, uh, once children go to the city and get material comforts and a little extra cash, they're not going to go home again, I suspect. And so what we saw here in this case of perhaps um, decent housing that would make it more desirable for young people to stay there and continue that way of life. So, mm -hmm. so you're talking about another benefit is that it may preserve the community. It may preserve the community, yeah. uh, Because mm -hmm. they will. Mm -hmm. But also when you're talking about how others in the community react, mm -hmm. these people with these almost new mansions uh, in their perspective. Uh, you said the culture is one that they're very giving and, and generous and not selfish. Mm -hmm. So if those cultural um, values are that deep, they would, I would think would be celebrating yeah. Others have been that poor. Oh, yes, I think so too. Yeah. On the final day, there was five homes were dedicated, and the homeowners uh, received their keys and a Bible and signed the mortgage paper and so forth. And the whole village came around to each home, and uh, the church choir sung outside. And, um, so yeah, it was um, it was a big doing for the community. 
those who indicate in our interview uh, mm. that people are very spiritual in, in this particular mm. community and religious. Mm -hmm. And so tell us a little more about, you, you talked about very descriptive and, and very informative about the living quarters and, and, and the, the diet. But tell us a little bit more about their spiritualism and other aspects of their life uh, and, and what they do in relation to work and leisure time. Our family in particular seemed very religious. Uh, uh, we would start the morning with tea, with a prayer. Um, we sang uh, Fijian songs uh, uh, at Sunday in Sunday uh, uh, services. Um, everybody goes to church on Sunday. Um, so it's, it's extremely uh, spiritual. And it's very interesting, though, because before we went, we studied a bit about Fiji, of course. And they used to be called the um, Cannibal Islands. And uh, the natives ran around without a st stitch of clothing on, uh, and uh, you know a person would get some kind of status with the number of people that uh, he, or, he or she would consume. Uh, they were also very violent, uh, cutting pieces off of you and hanging it up in the trees for people to be warned of how really uh, very treacherous they were. So along came the uh, British missionaries, and now you have the most docile and uh, quiet. I mean, not quiet in terms of uh, spirit, but in terms of uh, peacefulness and, uh, and again, the, the great uh, Christianity uh, influence there. You may recall from the slides how the women were dressed in very modest culture. Uh, it's made, makes bathing very difficult. You can't take anything off. Uh, there's no private bathing facilities, really. There's the river and some outdoor showers for this. And, uh, I forgot yeah. to say you asked how <laughs> our, our living conditions were. Uh, there was one shower in the village that was surrounded with uh, plastic that would kept kept falling off of, of the surround. And so we ended up going to the river to bathe with all of our clothes on. And uh, as I said, we were kind of in culture shock because at first the river seemed glorious. And then as we were down there, we realized that was where all the sewage went. And that was also where the women were pounding the, the diapers with their rocks and their sticks. And also one day when we were bathing, uh, one of the pieces of the fatted calf went floating <laughs> by. And so the, the romance of the river uh, lost uh, some as it, as it went along. Well, you're, you're very good communicators <laughs> and very descriptive. One other question, I'll go back to Steve, and that is, though, you have, you know, it was a wonderful experience. You have some concern about in, in, in those kind of conditions with the water, you know, uh, how does one be protective about some uh, particular diseases that one might get? Mm -hmm. Well, generally, you are counseled that you should get hepatitis shots or things of that sort. You do that with you go. go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then they made every effort, Habitat made every effort to actually uh, truck water from Suva or provide bottled water. Um, even so, um, you know, there were some conditions that we weren't quite prepared for mm -hmm. and got a little spooked about. And, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and it was so different from mm -hmm. Belfast. I don't know if we were, our disconfirmed expectations, maybe we were expecting mm -hmm. a little more of uh, what we saw there. But So this was really down uh, mm -hmm. with the people, which made mm -hmm. it exciting too. Mm -hmm. And I'm so thankful that our whole family was able to go. Uh, we've got great sh stories to share at every gathering now. Sure. Mm -hmm. Steve, In our previous show, we talked a little bit about the fact that team building is a mm -hmm. part of the Habitat experience for the volunteers, and that you spend the first few days mm -hmm. actually getting acquainted with your fellow volunteer team members. Mm -hmm. What were some of those people like? Who were you working with? Uh, we were working with about 19 or 20 others uh, from places like Tehachapi, California, Portland, Oregon, uh, New Jersey, Georgia. Uh, we had and, choir director uh, from Portland, for example, yeah. and a massage mm -hmm. therapist from Georgia. Um, young, old. We had uh, probably uh, several races there. And so it's very interesting because such different people, mm -hmm. and yet coming together for a common goal, um, it clicks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, were um, many of them first-time mm -hmm. uh, Habitat mm -hmm. people? So for mm -hmm. some, that was their first experience. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Did most fare as well as you did? Did uh, they adjust and... Mm -hmm. And not have health problems in other words? We had a few people with health problems. Um, one young lady from Georgia, uh, mm -hmm. it was a family that went with um, the massage therapist and her two daughters. And uh, the older one wasn't sure she wanted to go. And when she did go, um, kind of a last minute decision, uh, she got quite ill. Uh, it's so different. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the weather was different, the bugs are different, mm -hmm. uh, the water's different and everything. But most people did fine. Tell us how your two daughters reacted to, to one, it was a first experience, uh, for your youngest daughter it was a second time mm -hmm. with Habitat. How did, how did they enjoy the, the experience? Uh, Life-changing. And again, what we expected was very different than what we got 
And in fact, we were told before we went, don't expect anything out of Fiji. Uh, let it happen to you. And I think that's a, a good thing to remember. Our older daughter, as I said, was, was a ballet dancer. And she had these uh, like fantasies that she would be teaching the children ballet. <laughs> and then when we got to the village, I mean, we're slugging mm -hmm. it out in the mud and uh, walking around in, in dirt and everything. And, and so uh, let's forget the ballet stuff. But we had wonderful experiences of, of the uh, natives doing uh, traditional dances for us. Uh, one evening, our daughters uh, were walking home, and some little girls told us to come into their, this little hut, their cooking hut, and there they put on a whole show for us of uh, traditional uh, Fijian dances and, and music. Uh, what a delight. That's fabulous. What a delight. Were, were many of the team members uh, um, in family groups or couples, as opposed to single people who would come and, and, uh, and volunteer for the experience? That was about half and half, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and here's the burning mm -hmm. question for me. Uh, where are you going next? <laughs> Have you thought about it at all? Well, uh, it's a it's quite a commitment in terms of uh, expense, and so mm -hmm. it will take us a few years to um, maybe generate enough income to think about doing it again. But recently, which I think is exciting, uh, this global village concept is uh, going to happen in the United States. Uh, there's going to be global village. That means the groups coming together for two weeks, uh, in reservations in the Mississippi Delta, uh, in uh, in Appalachia. So I think that might be, uh, in my mind, one of our next uh, trips, to stay home and uh, participate in, in some of those areas. I think that would be really exciting. Okay. We're just about out of time, but it's going to be a wonderful discussion. I thought of other things that we have done in this country. In Eisenhower, President Eisenhower's office, we had the cultural exchange programs with many parts of the world. Under President Kennedy, we had the Peace Corps. So uh, Habitat was a private uh, venture. All of these bring people together, and do they not? And, and mm -hmm cultural exchanges, and it has had impacts in the world in the future. Well, it certainly has had an mm -hmm. impact on our lives. Mm -hmm. yes, I, again, I, I want to congratulate you uh, for what you've done. I know Steve Fink uh, joins me in that, and I want to thank you both uh, very much for being on this program, both not only this week, but last week. And I want to take this opportunity while we're on the air to say to you, uh, we're very proud to know you and call you our friends, and for you to be at North Meadows College and be this great ambassador that you're being to help others. Uh, you have the right spirit, uh, and we are grateful for you to be on the program and to be your colleague. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I know you found this program very interesting and inspiring. We are very grateful that we could bring it to you. Again, we'd like to thank KHQ6 for loaning us uh, Doug Miles for these programs uh, as he's the director of production. We appreciate that very much. And Next week, we're going to turn to yet another subject, and, and at that time, uh, talk about something we think is interesting. We always believe that we bring you things that you're interested in, and uh, I would like to, to invite you to be with us then. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. North Idaho College Public Forum is the longest running public television show of its type in North America, and is seen in seven states and two Canadian provinces. Each episode is pre-recorded live and is an educational community outreach from North Idaho College. Please join us again at this same time next week for another new edition of North Idaho College Public Forum on this public television station.